she picked up spinning and uh, she loves spinning now. No? So now she. I need Mike come up. Ah, there we go. Good evening, folks. I'm going to interrupt all your chats uh, so we can kind of get the show on the road a little bit here tonight. So, welcome to the Carlton to start um, for the third night of our uh, three Tuesday night talk series on robotics. Um, my name is Warren Connors. Uh, I'm an underwater robotics scientist. Uh, I'm a recipient of two robotically assisted surgeries. Um, and thanks to those two robotically assisted surgeries and a pretty talented surgical team, uh, I'm also a kidney cancer survivor. So I have the pleasure of, of being your, your host um, for a little talk series on robotics we have that's called A Pine of Robotics. I'm going to start by saying thanks so much to everybody for coming out. It was kind of funny when, when we first started this whole thing, I remember sitting in the sort of the green room with uh, Amanda and um, folks here from the Carlton. And I, was, I, I said to them, I was like, this is my like, high school moment because I invited everybody to a party and I'm really worried that nobody's going to show up, right? <laughs> so, so considering you know, we've had three nights of, of a sold out place, it's incredible to see the, the community support for the QE2 Foundation um, and just in general the interest in people coming out to, to hear some talks about robotics. So the whole point of a Pine of Robotics is, is to, to get a casual set of talks about robotics and some of the robotic innovation and, and robotic vision innovation that's going on right here in sort of our backyards. So Halifax or Atlantic Canada, a lot of people don't naturally see this area as kind of a, a hotbed for this kind of technology or, or technological innovation in general. Um, but I'm hoping that by the end of this series, which is tonight, um, that, that you'll be able to walk away and have a bit of a different perspective on, on some of the work that's happening here um, and, and next time you see maybe a piece of equipment being put in the water or in the air or on land, you'll, you'll be able to understand some of the story that's behind it. So, so our goal here isn't to, you know, like wow you with math or, or make you feel that you tuned into Extreme Nerd Night on PBS. Um, but instead, it's, it's to give you a chance to, to grab a beer, grab some food, sit with some friends, and hear some stories about some of that robotic innovation as told by some of the doctors, some of the scientists, some of the engineers and innovators that are doing this work every day. So of course, you know, before we get kicking though, we, we do have to go through a little bit of housekeeping. And, and for people who have actually been here for all three weeks, I'm sorry, because this has got to get boring by now. But, uh, <laughs> but we still have to do this. So, you know, the, the first element, um, nobody wants to, to talk about it anymore, but we still have to deal with COVID a little bit. So if you're getting up and you're moving around, please just make sure you put a mask on. It's pretty simple. If you're sitting down having your drinks, it's all great. But, but if you're moving around, keep that in mind. Um, of course, we're sitting here having some drinks, having some food, so you're probably wondering where the washrooms are. Just go to the end of the bar, hang a left, hang another left, and you'll see them there, right? Um, the other thing to note is, is we also have a live stream. And there's, there's been lots of folks that have joined us on Facebook. Um, 15 years trying not to be on Facebook, and now I'm finally there. Um, but, but if you keep in mind that there's, there is a few cameras, and uh, so if you don't want to be on Facebook, then just keep your head down. Um, and I think they do actually pan around during the break, so I'm just warning you. Um, tonight's format is, is all around uh, kind of a chilled out, relaxed night to, to hear some cool stories about robotics. So with that in mind, it's not going to be like a scientific conference where it's talk after talk after talk. Um, you know, we're, we're going to do a little bit of introductory notes here this morning, or this evening. Um, and then we'll take a little bit of a break, probably 10, 15 minutes, um, give the, the speaker a chance to, to get themselves a drink and uh, get set up, which is me, so I, I'll need one. Um, and then, uh, then we'll go into the first talk. First talk will be sort of anywhere between sort of 25 to 30 minutes, right? Um, at the end of that, we're, we're not putting hard limits on the talks because there's only two talks tonight. Um, but, but after that, we'll, we'll take a little break. And that'll give us a chance for everybody to, to grab another drink, grab some food, and then we'll switch over to, to the next speaker for the night, which is going to be uh, Dr. Ricardo Randon. So, so you'll note, though, that I didn't mention questions. And, and the reason why I didn't mention questions is when we originally started to plan this out, it was kind of pre-COVID, right? And we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could just have this really intimate environment where, where we could just pass a mic around and people could ask questions and we could have like a sort of a panel discussion. Uh, then COVID happened. Um, so, so what we tried to do to get around that is we're going to use something called Slido. And for people who have had all hands meetings at home or, or all that garbage over the last two years, it's probably, you're probably familiar with Slido. But, but effectively, it's just a website where you can submit a question. Right? Um, so everybody's invitation that was sent to them 
uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, would have a link. So there's a QR code and there's also a link. And you can follow that and it'll take you to Slido. And you can just submit your questions. It's anonymous, so don't be shy about asking questions because it's that question period that, that I've found, at least of the last two weeks, has really been interesting and some of the cool stuff that's come out um, in the discussions. So, so please, you know, um, as the talks are going on, submit your questions. At the end, um, Ricardo and I will sit up here, I'll have an iPad, and we'll go through some of those questions and we'll try and answer them. It can be about whatever you've heard tonight or over the last couple of weeks. If I can't answer the question, then reach out to the foundation and we'll find you an answer, okay? And then, of course, you know, I, I'd like to say that I'm just up here singing for my supper, but I'm not. This is a fundraising event, um, and, and you know, we're, we're out here to try and raise awareness about the robotics program and all the good that the QE2 Foundation does, but we're also trying to raise funds to, to help those programs as well. So you know, if you can, please you know, contribute to the foundation. You'll, you'll see on your, on your tables there's a QR code. If you follow that QR code, it'll take you to a website that was set up specifically for this event, and you can just donate through there, right? Otherwise, if you want to reach out to Amanda, who's around here somewhere, but that light's really bright, so I can't tell you where. There she is. Um, you know, you can reach out to Amanda and, and do the same. So with that in mind, I do want to take a, a minute or two and just talk about the foundation and talk about what they do and, and why I think it matters. Um, and then my friend Agnes is also going to talk a little bit about the same thing. So, so the QE2 Foundation is, is a charity that's, that's wholly devoted to the QE2 Health Sciences Center. So for people who aren't from here or some of the live stream people, um, you know, the, the QE2 Health Sciences Center is, is really kind of a conglomerate of hospitals, right? And, and what's amazing is, is they're the largest health sciences uh, center in the region, which means the scope of what they have to do is huge when you think about it. Um, all the way from, you know, neonatal care all the way out to, you know, um, cancer in the elderly, they, they have a lot of work to do and a lot of people. So, so the foundation has tackled this problem of supporting sort of the, the quality of life of patients and, and also um, um, sort of advancing the, the level of care that, or the level of equipment that they have through a few different ways. Um, one, of course, is, you know, buying that next piece of equipment because that's very important, uh, but also, you know, funding research and funding education. And, and funding process improvements to, to improve patient care. So, so it's, it's a really, really, really broad spectrum of things that, that they're trying to tackle. Um, when we started putting this talk together, and, and I was working with Amanda about this, you know, there, there were a few numbers that kind of came out, and they floated to the top, and they had an impact on me, and I think that's, uh, that's hopefully what I'll try and convey to you over the next minute or two. Um, this, one, this one's huge to me, is <laughs> one million patient visits, right? One million patient visits to, to the QE2 Health Sciences Center. Um, when you consider that there's 970,000 people in the province, um, a million patient visits. I bet everybody in here hasn't been to the hospital this year, right? So you think about the number of people that have to go through there and the scope of care that's required by the foundation to be able to, to provide um, for that million patients. It's, it's massive, right? And that's something that the QE2 Foundation tries to help. 250 million bucks. So. It's 25 years that the QE2 Foundation's been around. $250 million, right? Like, I'm a government scientist. That number is just, pfft, like, I can't, you know, I can't even imagine it. Um, but it's, it's a huge number, and that's raised through donations from regular people, right, who want to improve the quality of care, who want to improve the quality of life of people here in, in the Maritimes. So a couple of programs, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mangle these, especially because now there's, like, doctors in the house. But... Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the programs that, that some of that money is helping to support. Right? And one is the hybrid OR. And this is really cool. It's, it's trying to put together a highly technologically advanced operating room. Right? So it's giving the surgical teams the, the flexibility to be able to have diagnostic imaging and also to be able to switch between sort of invasive and non-invasive surgeries very rapidly. Right? What's cool about this is you're giving the surgical team options and you're also saving critical time for the actual patients themselves. Another one, and, and this is one that, that's, that's close to my heart, um, and I'm sure it's close to, to the hearts of a lot of people here, is, is cancer therapy. So one of the weird things that happens when you find out that you've got cancer is a clock starts in your head, right? So, you know, when is my next appointment? When's my next treatment? When's my next surgery? When's my next scan? You know, and, and that is something that, you know, people talk a lot about cancer as a physical disease, but there's also the mental impact, which is brutal, right? Because you're always thinking about that. So through process improvement, the, the, the foundation is working with the government 
to effectively uh, fund a, a new cancer therapy lab, which is increasing the throughput. So it's, it's doubling the capacity uh, for, for, in this case, um, for cancer treatments, like things like chemotherapy, which, which shortens those wait times, right? And again, if you've ever sat there and you're waiting for when's my next thing, that's huge, right? And again, this is all being funded by regular people. And then, of course, Da Vinci, which is one you're going to hear about a fair bit tonight. Um, and Da Vinci's, da Vinci's a robot, this robot, I know this robot, and it knows me pretty well as well. Um, it doesn't look as sinister as this when they wheel you in, by the way, right? But trust me, you know, people would be a little bit nervous if they saw that. Um, so Da Vinci is, is a, a robot, it's, it's effectively aiding the surgeon, right? So one of the things you'll hear a lot about when we talk about robotics is autonomous robotics or, or telepresence or robots that are, that are aiding a human that's doing some work, right? And this is a great example of it. So, and this was funded by 2,600 donors, right? 2,600 people reached in their pocket and helped fund this program. And because of this program, this has changed the lives of a ton of people because it's focused on gynecological, kidney, ENT, prostate cancers, you know, um, really, really, really <laughs> scary cancers, right? Being treated by this robot. And again, this is being funded by regular people. So Mike Dunbar gave a talk on the first night. And uh, if, if you missed it, I, I would suggest you tune in because it was a great talk. But, um, but he, he made this quote. He said, there's no area of medicine that robotics has entered that it hasn't improved. So I hope through this series people get an appreciation that there is no area that robotics has entered that it hasn't improved in some way, right? Whether that's medicine, whether it's deep sea research, whether it's space. Um, you know, it's, it's, that's the big impact that robotics has. And then finally, you know, 20,000. And, and for me, this was a, a really, really humbling number because it's 20,000 people who don't even know me who dug into their pockets. And because they dug into their pockets, it actually funded a capability that had a massive impact on my quality of life, right? I have, well, one-third and uh, two-thirds of a kidney. Sum them up, I got a kidney. Um, because of this capability, right, that was funded by just regular people. So, but tonight, because normally I go off and I, I give you guys all a sob story about what happened to me. Tonight, <laughs> Agnes is going to join us. And, and Agnes uh, also had effectively the same surgeries as me. And, and I wanted to give her an opportunity to tell you guys a story. So please, folks, Agnes. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to start off by saying that I have spent my entire working career as a human resources specialist, so about as far away from robotics as a person is going to get. My exposure to robots was strictly Hollywood, uh, Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, Star Wars, purely in the movies. So uh, I had no idea that robot-assisted robot sur robot surgeries existed, and certainly not here in Halifax. In February 2020, I received a shocking diagnosis of two large tumors, one in my right kidney and one in my left. And I say shocking because up until that point, I had no idea that I was ill. My husband and I had retired in 2017, and we were living the dream until that dream came crashing down around us. The dreaded words cancer put in a sentence with, I wish I had better news for you by a general practitioner, sent our world into total chaos. Luckily for me, I ended up under the care of Dr. Rendon and Da Vinci, and uh, I had my first partial nephrectomy in March of 2020, and my second was scheduled for April of 2020. So if you recall, in April 2020, it was our first lockdown for COVID. I had friends and family who had their surgeries canceled, postponed, postponed indefinitely, all doctor's appointments went to online via phone if you were lucky enough to get to talk to one. So we waited anxiously for a call to say that my surgery was going to be canceled as well or postponed. Luckily, that was a call that never came. Because my surgery was going to be robot assisted, my surgery was allowed to go through. And my understanding of that is because there's minimal contact between the surgeon and patient. So on April 22nd, my husband drove me to the Victoria General Hospital, and he left me at the door to pick me up six days later. Uh, and to put lockdown in a total, to 
the lockdown in perspective, when he dropped me off at the door, I saw one person on the main level that was a, a security guard. And I did not see another person until I got up to the 10th or 11th floor, wherever they check you in. And when I got up there, there was myself and one other woman that were being checked in for surgeries that day. That was it, just us two and the nurses. So it seemed to me, it was a crazy time, but it seemed to me like the world was standing still. But da Vinci was moving me forward. Uh, it, was, it was really wild. So when Warren asked if I'd like to say a few words tonight about what the QE2 Foundation and uh, robotic surgeries mean to me, I sat back and thought about some of the things that I've done over the last year, couple of years, and how the QE2 Foundation, their donors, uh, surgeons, Dr. Rendon and his team, and Da Vinci have changed my life. Seven weeks after my second surgery, I was down at Heartlands Point playing golf with my husband and friends. Still boggles my mind to this day that you can have a major surgery, six weeks you can have another one, seven weeks later you can be down golfing. Got the pictures to prove it, so it really happened. <laughs> I have been quoted as saying that uh, Da Vinci has made me a better golfer, and I stand by that. <laughs> I got my name on a trophy this year, and uh, I'm not recommending that you go this route to become a better golfer, but you know, there's an upside to everything. I, my, all the priorities in my life have changed. The dust bunnies now roam freely around my home. I t have a whole new respect for my friends and family that surrounded us when we were going through this. I have taken my fiddle to the beach on an early morning sunrise and played for an hour. I have picked up guitar lessons. My sister and I and our spouses have crashed a private party at a winery and danced the <laughs> afternoon away. I've sat on the beach with a glass of wine and just looked at the stars in a beautiful evening. And of course golfed whenever and wherever I can. But the most beautiful gift, besides my life, <laughs> that uh, the QE2 Foundation and robotics have given me is a beautiful granddaughter. Robin Marie Randall was born September of this year, and that's a gift for sure. I take nothing in life for granted. I lost my sister and a good friend last year to cancer. Both types of cancer which are now or would now be able to be performed with robot-assisted surgeries. They struggled with chemotherapy and radiation, which we did not have to do, thank God. And um, before they left this world, they both expressed on numerous occasions how much hope that our story gave them. Hope for their children, for their grandchildren, that if, God forbid, they had to go through this, they would have this technology to help them. So I thank the QE2 Foundation, sponsors, doctors, surgeons, their teams, my hero, Da Vinci, which makes Dr. Rendon my hero, too, because he makes him run. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. My family has a love for the QE2 Foundation. And thank you for asking me tonight to speak. It's great. That's it. So I think it's pretty clear, folks, um, you know, especially if you've heard the other nights, you heard my story as well, you know, the, the impact that, that people giving to the QE2 Foundation really has. Right, and I think that's the point, and that's why that 20,000 is so massively humbling to me. Because when I came out and I realized that this wasn't some big federal program, this wasn't some, you know, it was, it was people just digging in their pockets, and who will never know me, never know Agnes, but they changed our lives quite fundamentally. So, so when I got out and I started to get better, um, I remember talking to colleagues, and I was talking about this capability. And, and a lot of colleagues didn't, didn't know this capability existed, right? So it was, it was quite interesting, because it's like, wow, you know, I didn't know Halifax had that, right? But then I got talking uh, one day with, with Ricardo, and I was talking about what we do. Um, so I work for a lab, you're going to hear all about it, so I'm not going to go on about it right now. Um, but I work for a lab that does underwater robotics, right? And so that started the conversation. He was like, wow, I didn't know you guys did that. Right? And there was a realization that, you know, we don't socialize this stuff well enough. And that's really where Pino Robotics came out, because we wanted to do something to give back. But then we thought, wow, this is kind of a cool story to tell, right? Because a lot of people don't think about this. So, so the goal really was to, to raise some awareness on some of the innovative work that's taking place in our community, and of course support existing and future programs within the foundation. 
The speakers, um, if you've been involved in the last few weeks, have been from all over the map. So we've had, uh, we've had people from academia, we've had people from industry, we've had obviously people from medicine and, and government labs as well. So you know, the talks have ranged everything from garbage trucks in space to a really, really scary look at knee surgery um, to you know um, what you hear about tonight in deep sea robotics and, and hunting for Franklin's wreck. So so it's been all across the board. So so tonight um, two speakers for tonight. Um, I I don't know how this worked out, Ricardo, but you're always the guy here, right? Um, so I'm going to start. I had the first talk um, specifically on. Uh, so I work for a place called Defense Research and Development Canada. I'm going to talk about autonomous robotics at DRDC uh, and some of the cool missions that we've done. Um, and then uh, Dr. Ricardo Rendon is going to, he's from Surgical Robotics for the QE2, of course, and he's going to talk about advanced urological surgical robotics at the QE2. So, so folks, um, like I said, please, you know, uh, if you see some questions or if something pops to your mind, um, please submit them, right? Because cause that's the interesting part of the chat. It's a lot more free form, and sometimes the, the stuff you learn is neat. Um, and as I said, you know, if you can, please, you know, if you're enjoying the night, then, then please donate. So, so we're going to take about... Uh, 10, 12 minutes, uh, get set up for the first talk, um, which is mostly just me going over and drinking a glass of wine. Um, and then, uh, then we'll, we'll kick it off, and we'll start with the first talk of the night. Thank you so much for listening, folks.
same thing. When I ask around, no one's calling you alive, but there's no smoke without fire. The alibi is so many. Hey folks, gonna interrupt your meals again. This is gonna happen all night, so. Um, so normally, uh, you know, when, when we give these talks, um, you know, I would do a, a bit of a bio or an introduction to somebody, but it felt a little weird to stand up here and introduce myself to you guys. So Agnes was, was nice enough to, uh, to, to start with my bio, and then we'll, we'll kick into a talk about autonomous robotics at DRDC. Uh, I would like to give a bit of a bio of his, and I'm going to read it because he has uh, he has quite a portfolio, and I don't want to trust anything to my memory. So bear with me. I'm going to read it. I don't want to forget anything. Um, so Warren was born in the fine city of St. John, New Brunswick, in 1976. He has a <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> good year in a good place. <laughs> Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Machine Learning from Dalhousie University. He started his career with MDA in Halifax and uh, working in robotics and space systems. In 2007, he left industry and joined Defense Research and Development Canada working in autonomy and perception for maritime robotic systems. One frosty day in 2013, Warren decided he had had enough of winter and decided to join the NATO Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation in Lisbezia, Italy. That just sounds nice, doesn't it? <laughs> I'd like to go there. Um, he assumed the role of a defense scientist working in multi-robot autonomy and techniques for autonomous naval mine countermeasures until 2017. Since 2018, Warren has been the group leader for the Mine Warfare Group at DRDC Atlantic Research Center focused on the application of robotics to mine countermeasures. Warren's research interests are in autonomy for communications, limited environments, machine learning, trust in autonomy, and multi-agent autonomy for robotic collaboration. Now that's a portfolio. <laughs> um, on a personal note, uh, Warren and I connected as kidney cancer survivors, with both of us being part of the QE2 robotics program through Dr. Rendon. Our stories have been shared several times through different mediums. Uh, and although we have chatted via email off and on, we finally got to meet a couple of weeks back. I was very impressed with the work that he has done along with the QE2 Foundation to put on this multi-evening event. It's always difficult to know what to do on how to spread the word on programs like this. And I believe this is an excellent forum for it. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of it. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Warren Connors. Hey, folks. I bet you I look familiar. Um, so, so if you ever go to a conference, right, one of, the, one of the most difficult parts is when somebody's like, oh, your talk is at the last, right? Because cause you then get to spend the next, the, the next few days listening to people do a better job explaining about what you're going to have to talk about later on. So... So, you know, following on for, from some of the great talks that we've seen in uh, maritime robotics, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about autonomous robotics, which is, which is a bit of a variation on, on uh, what you've seen so far. Um, and, and I'm going to try and explain to you why autonomous robotics matters and, and why we need autonomy in robotics. 
And, and then we're going to move on, and, and the fun part is we're going to talk a little bit about some of the cool missions that we've done over the years at DRDC. Um, because again, a lot of people don't understand some of the cool stuff that's actually happened out of here and, and out of sort of our labs on the West Coast and things like that. So, so of course, I got to put in my plug for my work because, um, of course, my boss is in the room. So, you know, it's, it's performance review time. Um, no, DRDC, DRDC is an agency of the Canadian Department of National Defense, right? So, you know, you can see um, this is our, our primary building here on Grove Street in Dartmouth. Uh, it's a brand new building and showing off the finest in government beige. Um, so we work with, with industry and government and academia, and, and we're, we're there to tackle problems that are of interest to the Department of National Defense, but also to public safety, right? So, so more than, than just necessarily the military. It's such a cool place because we have such a broad scope of people that we work with, right? It's, it's, there's 200 people here. There's five labs across the country. I think there's a total of roughly, I think, 2,000 people, something like that. Um, and, and they're from, from such a various set of backgrounds, right? So, you know, I work for a mathematician. I work with a statistician all the time. I'm a machine learning guy. So, and you need all these different skill sets to work together. So it's super interesting. Um, and we got a couple of neat facilities, right? Obviously, as I pointed out, this, this uh, beige masterpiece here. Um, but then also, you know, we, we, uh, we've got a barge. I don't have a photo of this. Um, so it's a blue barge. If you go down by Chinatown in the basin, you'll see this. It looks like a blue warehouse floating on a barge. That's the acoustic calibration barge. So we actually put uh, experiments in the water there and do a fair bit of work there. I don't think it's there right now, but, but normally it is. Um, and we also have a couple of Arctic facilities. So, you know, Gascoigne Inlet here. Uh, so this is sort of mid-Arctic. Uh, if people know where Resolute is, um, Gascoigne is, is, is right sort of to the right of uh, about 90 miles um, of Resolute. So this is a cool facility. Um, it looks like a big red building with a bunch of little red shacks because that's what it is. Um, so, you know, the, the primary building here is where we all go to eat and watch movies. Um, and then these are all where we sleep and a really, really cold shower. And uh, we, we use this spot to be able to do some experiments in local waters up there, right? Everything from listening to, to the ocean to using robotics up there. And you'll see that a little bit. And then if you go on Google Earth and you go all the way to the tip of the continent, um, you'll see a set of buildings that kind of stand out because everything's white and then there's like five or six buildings up there. And that's a place called CFS Alert. And at CFS Alert, we actually have uh, a building there and, and that's where we keep a bunch of our equipment for when we're doing experiments in, in the high Arctic, right? Um, so oddly enough, it's, you go in there and it's like snowmobiles and camping gear and chocolate bars, but it's, it's still a pretty cool spot. Uh, so this is called the Spinnaker Building. And, and uh, keep that in mind because you're actually going to hear a little bit about that. Um, but DRDC uh, at Atlantic, so you know when, when I first, well, I was actually working for industry when I first started working with DRDC in robotics. Um, but we have a kind of a long history in doing underwater robotics, right? We, we are mostly an underwater lab here at Atlantic. So I want to start by talking a little bit about underwater robotics and, and sort of try and counter off some of the whys. I'm going to try and stay out of the way so people can actually see this. Um, you know, a lot of people think of a robot as, you know, a white robot with legs and arms and it's just haunt on its chest and it pours tea for the elderly. Um, but, but there's a lot more to robotics than that, right? And, and in underwater robotics, you'll see that they're, and, and in most forms of robotics, you'll see that they're actually built um, for the job they need to do, right? That's the cool thing with robotics, right? As humans, we have to do a whole bunch of jobs and, and make do with what we have. We have arms and legs and all those things. Um, but, but with a robot, you can make it do exactly what you need, right? If you need it to move around quickly, why give it legs? Give it wheels, right? Well, it's the same with underwater. So you can see here, these are some of the systems that we work with every day here at Atlantic. So this, this, uh, this is called an IVER-3, right? Um, most of these systems are all built in Canada by, by innovative little companies. Uh, except for the IVER-3, that comes from the US. Um, fun fact, though, it's run by a company where the guy's name is James Kirk, is the, the CEO. <laughs> so I, I just, I love this company. Um, so, you know, why would we use robotics, right? Well, robotics are really good at doing jobs that we can't do safely, right? The, the dull, dark, dirty, dangerous is, you know, that's what you see in all the literature. But when you think about it, like whether it's deep space, whether it's highly radioactive environments, whether it's deep sea, right? We need the ability to, to do work there or, or to sense or to do things, but, but it's really, really hard to put humans in that environment, right? And that's where robotics really buys a lot, right? Robotics don't replace humans. Robotics sort of amplify the capabilities of humans. And that's, that's something that I think you know, you'll hear when they talk about da Vinci. And, and it's the same with deep sea robotics, right? Um, 
In Canada, it's ideal because we have vast spaces that are hard to work in, right? Whether it's deep sea or whether it's, you know, the Arctic tundra, right? These are spots where robotics can really give you a lot. Then, you know, like, why is it hard, right? Um, well, when you start talking about underwater robotics, um, and I learned this one really quickly, everything's hard underwater, right? The environment itself is causing you problems, right? It's, it's corrosive. It's hard to communicate. It's hard to move. It's hard to navigate. We don't have GPS underwater, right? It's hard to sense things underwater. Um, so, you know, so it's, it's really, really challenging. And that, that fact that we don't have to or that we can't communicate well um, is a big part of this talk itself. So why, you know, like, look at these. They all look pretty cool, right? Why do we need to conduct research? Well, we need to, you know, DRDC and organizations like that, we don't build the new robot, right? Our goal, really, is to advance the capabilities of that robot so that it's, that it's more useful or better at what it needs to do. So, you know, some of that is innovating on, on hardware, making the robots more robust, making the robots more capable, right? It's innovating on sensors so that they can actually see the world around them and perceive that world around them much better. And then the roles, right? We certainly have not exhausted all the roles where we can use underwater robotics or, or any form of robotics. Um, you know, to develop more effective autonomy, and that's kind of the point of the first part of this talk, but, but it's, it's the ability to give the robot, uh, or sorry, the, it's, it's, yeah, it's giving the robot the ability to actually make decisions on its own. If it can't communicate, somebody's got to be thinking this stuff up. Um, and then develop effective ways for humans to team, right? So humans are really good at a lot of things. We're super adaptable, right? Um, robots are good at a lot of things. They're super precise, right? And they can work in environments we can't. When you can team them, then you get the best of both worlds, right? So that's a big part of the work. So autonomy. Let's see if I can do this in two slides. OK, the, it's, it's really the challenge of control, right? So when you put a robot in the water, it's like putting a robot in deep space. If you can't communicate with it easily, then the robot needs to be able to start making its own decisions to be able to actually do what it needs to do, right? Um, a good example would be if you were in deep space, where you've got lots of bandwidth. You can communicate with it, but it takes a long time for the message to get there and come back. A lot of things have changed in the meantime. Underwater, it's kind of the worst of both worlds because we have very little bandwidth and the communications is terrible. So, you know, this is a, a logarithmic graph, and I know everyone's going to look at me and go, nerd. But the point is, is that acoustic communications is how we communicate underwater, right? It's order of magnitudes less than what we can do with just your mobile phone and Wi Fi, right? So when you talk about, um, for instance, you know, megabytes per second on your phone, or megabits per second on your phone, right? Or gigabits per second on your house, your, your Bell fiber optic line. Um, we're talking bits per second, right? And even then, it doesn't always get there. So, so, you know, when we start thinking about that, remote control, like what you're used to thinking about, it just isn't possible, right? So when you put a robot in the water and you let it go, you better hope you remembered everything. Because if you forgot something, it's not coming back, right? <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, if you signed out this $2 million robot, you know, <laughs> you kind of want it to come back. So, so our goal here really is, is we're aiming to let the robots make the decisions in difficult or changing environments, right? So you guide the robot, you tell it what you want it to do, but the robot's really dealing with a lot of the implementation of things, right? Um, and, and we're trying to make them more adaptable so they're more successful at what we're asking them to do. There's nothing more frustrating than putting a robot in the water and realizing you forgot something and you sit there in a little rubber boat for eight hours and it pops back up again and you realize it didn't do anything. <laughs> right? Um, and Sean's there, he's, done, he's, he's sat in rubber boats with me doing this. So when I talk about autonomy, I, I really talk about three concepts, right? And, and they build on each other. So the first one is automatic, right? Automation. We all know what automation is, right? Cruise control in your car is a good example of automation, right? But there's a problem with that. If you get in your car and you set your cruise control at 150 kilometers an hour, and you go down the highway and there's a car in front of you that's doing 100 and you don't do anything about it, you're going to have an accident, right? Because the robot, in this case your cruise control, the system did exactly what you told it to do and nothing else, right? So the next step is something that's called adaptivity or, or adaptive processing, right? And this is like a modern car that has adaptive cruise control, right? Where, where the, the, the system is looking through one sensor, in this case a camera or radar or something like that, and it's saying, oh, there's a car in front of me. And that car isn't going as quickly as I am. So you adjust the speed. So adaptivity is sort of, I have a mission, but I look through a sensor and figure out that 
that I need to adjust a parameter of my mission. One thing, a parameter, speed in this case, right? So that's adaptivity. But adaptivity requires automation to work. It still needs a cruise control, right? But you've added a layer on top of that where it's actually thinking about it. Autonomy or autonomous systems, and this is really where we're going, is it, it, it's sort of you specify what you want the robot to do in very high-level goals. Right? So, you know, I don't, I don't have a really good cruise control. Well, you know what? Like, fully autonomous driving, right? It's looking at multiple parameters in this case. It's looking at what's going on around the car. It's looking at the road signs. It's looking at everything else to optimize what you've asked it to do. Get you home from the pub safe, right? Um, I, I'm a robotics guy, but I will not let an autonomous car drive my ass home from the pub. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, autonomous systems really is... is Taking that next step where, where you're giving the robot high-level goals and the, and the robot is responsible for planning and perceiving and executing that, right? So when I first started this job, right, how hard can it be? Well, it turns out it can actually be pretty hard. Um, robots need to be able to do a few things to be effective uh, from an autonomous perspective, right? They need to be able to sense, just like we do, right? We have all kinds of senses, but not just sense. Because if, if you only had your eyes, you'd be getting all kinds of information and you wouldn't know what to do with it because you don't know how to process it. Right? We have a visual cortex that allows you to perceive things, and that's perception. So as an example here, you can see here, this is a, what we call a side scan image. So our robots have, have sonars, and they look out to the side. This image is a, sort of a very busy seafloor, right? but it doesn't really mean anything on its own. Now, if you can combine it, with a perception algorithm that can look for things that matter to the robot, right? Just like us, we look for things that matter to us. We classify what we're seeing. We perceive things, right? And that's what the robot needs to be able to do to be able to understand the world that it's living in, right? That's how the robot makes decisions. So you're turning data into information. And then it needs to move, right? Um, doesn't you know? In some cases, yes, there's there's stationary robotics, but I like ones with propellers and wheels and all that stuff. So so it needs to move. Um, but to be able to move, you need to plan. You need to be able to plan a mission. You need to be able to set some goals, right? So so for what we do on the seafloor, we plan tracks that look like these. You can see it looks kind of like a ladder, right? Um, appropriately called a ladder search. So so in this case, um, the robot can lay out where it needs to be to do a task. And in this case, the task is to survey the seafloor and, and like get images like this. right? But to be able to do that, as I said, navigation is really hard. right? So the robot now needs to be able to leverage the capabilities of perception to be able to then see what it's like, look through its own sensors, see the seafloor, and say, OK, now I know where I am. That's something that's called terrain-based navigation that we do right here. So, so the robot senses this little patch right here. And this is what it knows about the world, and it correlates it to and says, oh, well, I must be right here. Right? So, so that's how you can navigate. Right? Um, and then it needs to act. Right? It needs to do something. If not, then why did you just spend $2 million on a robot? Right? Um, but sometimes that's just listen. Sometimes that's you know, understand the environment. Sometimes that's go find things. Right? Sometimes that's change the environment. Right? But it all comes back to understanding the world, having a plan, and making those decisions. And that's really the kind of core elements of, of, of autonomy. right? And then finally, sometimes robots need to play well with each other. right? So remember I said earlier, right? you, you, uh, you have these specialist robots. right? Like, why bother building a robot with wheels if it's going to go in the ocean? But the problem is, is then you get these specialist robots, and now you need to do a complex task. So you might need multiple robots. And they need to play well with each other. right? And again, you're working in an environment where communication sucks. So it's, it's quite challenging, right? And that's called multi-agent autonomy, which is something we, we work on a fair bit. Mm -hmm. And you can see sort of down here an example of a couple of the things that I mentioned already. So what happened was the robot started with a plan like this here, right? Just this ladder search where everything's all equally distributed. And the robot got in the water, these blue lines, and it said, oh, you know what? My sonar is not working as good as I thought it was going to in this environment. So it was adaptive. It changed where those lines were. Right? And the robot started sort of getting closer and closer together so it could ensure it could see all the seafloor. Right? But at the same time, it was playing well with others. Because there was another robot. You can see this little red line. So this little guy was just hanging, up, hanging out and, and waiting for something to do. And, and when it found something to do, because the other robot found something, it then shot in, 
and it had a different sensor, so it had a, like a visual sensor, and it had a look at what was interesting on the seafloor. And that's a good example of multi-agent autonomy where they have to actually play together. All right, there you go. Nerd lecture's over. Uh, now we're going to talk about missions and some of the fun stuff that we've actually done at DRDC um, and, and in collaboration with, of course, our, our partners and, and industry. Um, this one's really cool, um, and part of it is because when it was. So um, Theseus and, and Arx were, were part of a project called Spinnaker, right? And the idea was if you had an array out in the ocean, in this case the Arctic Ocean, and you wanted to connect it to shore, well, how are you going to do that, right? Because there's ice on top, right? So the idea was let's build an AUV. This was the, the first prototype, Arx, that could sort of poop out a fiber optic cable as it's going along, right? <laughs> And, and, and it would go from one end to the other and then connect the array to the shore, right? Now, you got to keep in mind, like, given the day, right? We're talking about 1988, right? Like, high tops and mullets were still big, right? <laughs> so so this, was, this was a really big deal to be able to do this. And it spawned sort of two, prob two programs. ARCS, um, which was a prototype. So this was built by a company called ISE on the West Coast. And, uh, and it, was, it was there really to prove the concept. Right, um, so Arx was was a relatively large vehicle, about the length of this uh, this stage, uh, and it could spool out a short cable, right? And then when they proved that it could work, then Theseus came along, right? And Theseus was massive, right? Because it needed a lot of batteries to go in the Arctic and go under the ice, and it needed to to reel out this this long cable, right? Um, but but it was it was so crazy that they wanted to do this given the day, right? Like. You know, the, nobody had attempted to do this before, right? And, and doing it under the ice was, was pretty wild. It was the longest AUV, AUV mission of its day. And technology wasn't exactly what it is today, right? So for instance, there you go. <laughs> Advanced personal uh, entertainment device had mega, ba mega bass and AM FM radio, <laughs> right? Or how about this little gem, right? This was the future of modern transportation back in the day, right? <laughs> I'm a car guy, and I'm so happy we didn't go down this road, right? Or maybe follow it up with anybody who worked in science back then remembers the warm glow of a CRT and 12 floppy disks beside you, right? And if you don't know what a floppy disk is, you're under 40. Um, and then, of course, advanced cellular communications, right? As long as you were standing next to a tower in three cities in this country, it would work. So my point with this little sarcastic little... Uh, little soliloquy there is, is that the technology was so basic at the time. So, so to go out and do something as audacious as building this massive vehicle, I mean, look, that's a person right there, note the mullet. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it was, it was a huge vehicle and it was a huge mission that they were trying to accomplish, right? And that is Spinnaker, and that's why it's called Spinnaker, right? So, so they did these ice missions where they would store a bunch of camping gear and a bunch of stuff like that so they could go out and set up a camp on the ice and, and run this vehicle, and they did it, right? And it was so crazy that they were able to do it back then. Um, like, I was in high school, right? And I'm old. So, you know, I mean, when you think about that. So, fo <laughs> following on from there, um, this is one of the first robotics projects I got involved in with DRDC, was this project called RMSTD, right? And the idea was, well, why can't we go out and use a robot to go ahead of ships and detect mines on the seafloor, right? Naval mines are, are you know, something I work on a fair bit and DRDC worries about. Um, and they're a real challenge because they're hard to find, right? And they have a tendency to blow up when you go over them. So, you know, so ideally, if we could use a robot to do that job, right, we could keep sort of the, the people out of, out of danger, right? And that's where RMS came in. Um, so RMS was like this huge vehicle um, called Dorado. And then it had this little, it almost looks like an airplane on the bottom. You can see it down here better. And that was called Aurora. And the way RMS would work was the, the vehicle itself would separate, right? So you'd have a cable connecting Aurora and, and to Dorado up here. And Aurora would fly along the seafloor like an airplane that's doing terrain following, right? Because ideally, for your sensors, you want to keep them in the same altitude off the seafloor all the time, right? So that's how Aurora worked. So it was this, this hugely complicated coupled system, right? So, so when we had this in 200 meters of water, we had a kilometer of cable out, right? Because the cable goes like this. It doesn't go straight down, right? So, so it, was, it was a really neat project because 
again, we hadn't done it, right? So, so this, was, this was sort of a, a new concept, right? Um, the cool thing was is it still had a mass that stuck up. So you could still have some basic uh, remote control, right? And people could interact with the vehicle um, when it messed up, because it was, it was a prototype, so it messed up um, on occasion. And, and it turned into this extensive trials and development program. So you can see here, this is a little ship on the west coast uh, that's called an MCDV, so it's a Royal Canadian Navy ship. Um, and you can see the vehicle here, so it's submerged. So you could almost see the gray here, and then the antenna's sticking up, right? And that's how we would communicate with the robot. Um, and, and it was really, really cool, because we, we did a lot of work with this. We, we took it to France, we took it to Italy, we did work on the west coast a whole bunch, and we took it to the Olympics. Um, so believe it or not, this was running under Lionsgate Bridge, um, to collecting data before the Olympics happened. Um, funny side story, of course, um, is this picture's from the Olympics, and you can see that that piece right there is supposed to actually be connected here and standing up like that. And it's because on the West Coast, there's a lot of logs that are about this much under the surface of the water, right? So we were doing nine knots, and we found one. Um, <laughs> so it worked like it was supposed to, but it was still kind of a bummer. Um, so, but the cool thing was, was it, it demonstrated the concept, right? And that was the point, that we could use robotics to, to take people out of harm's way in a very specific case. And, and that was really neat. So, and, and this is kind of my last example of the night, but this is one of my favorites, and this is called Cornerstone. Cornerstone was a very, very cool mission. And the idea was, the, under the United Nations Council of Law of the Sea, they were looking for where Canada's uh, continental shelf ended. Right? So, so you could take some helicopters up there and you could drill holes in the ice and you could put sensors down and you could try and record where it is, but you can imagine that that takes a lot of time and that takes a lot of money and it's pretty challenging because you only get one little spot sounding, right? So a couple of folks said, hey, you know what? We could probably use robots for that, right? Because they're under the ice. They're submerged, no problem, right? So this is a good example of kind of like a, like a, we would call that a point cloud, but it's like this is what the texture of the seafloor looks like. So you can see this kind of mount there. Right, um, and it was a really audacious mission because, you know, wh where Theseus and Arx were focused on, you know, going under the ice, they weren't going that deep, right? To do what we wanted to do here, you had to go super deep, like beyond three thousand meters. Um, and you know, like if you think about, uh, I don't know, look, we've got a submariner now, so he could probably do the math on on what that would do. But but the pressures at three thousand meters is insane. One thing goes wrong, and that's it. Forget it. So so you know, it was. It was a really big trick. And then on top of that, we were going to do it for multiple days. Because if you're going to put a vehicle out there and it's going to go down, it's going to do those surveys, it's got to go for a long time. So there were really a lot of challenges around this. And the cool thing was is it sort of required the development of a lot of new technologies. At the time, though, we said, hey, we could do it with robots. And the government, surprisingly, was like, oh, well, here's a bag of money. <laughs> so OK, well, now we've got to put our money where our mouth is and figure out how to do this. We built these vehicles with ISE, a company on the West Coast. Um, and these are called Explorers. And they got the nickname Arctic Explorers. And they were built to be able to do multi-day endurance. So you let them go, and they go for a few days, and go super deep. So these are 5,000 meter capable vehicles. right? So, But we needed to, to develop a lot of new technologies to be able to actually do this job. And, and one, of course, was we needed technologies to help to navigate. right? Remember I said navigation is super hard underwater. right? Because you don't have GPS like you do, like, like we do on our phones or in our cars or all that other stuff. So, so to be able to navigate underwater, we have to do something that's called dead reckoning. Right? Um, it's effectively, uh, if you start and you, have, you know where you are, and then you start integrating where you're moving every single step, right? you can always maintain a bit of a hypothesis for where you are at any given time. There you go. That's exactly what it is. right? Um, so we use something called inertial navigation systems. And, and humans kind of work like this too, right? Because you have almost accelerometers in your head that you, know, you can close your eyes and, and generally predict where you're going to be, right? That's why you can walk around a dark room. Um, but there's a problem. They drift, right? Just like we do. So if you walk around a dark room too many times, you're going to walk into something, right? Um, so, so we needed to figure out ways to get around that. Because if you're going to send a mission for multiple days and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, if you're only drifting, say, at 1% of your distance, that's fine. But if you go 100 kilometers, that's a problem, right? So how do we get around that? Well, what we did was we went to the Arctic, and we developed a couple new systems. One was, was a, like a beacon, almost, that you would home in on. And as you got closer, right, another system would kick in with a bunch of 
acoustic modems effectively that could talk to it. And they all knew where they were. So once the robot comes into that field, they could all talk to each other and they could figure out, oh, well, this is where the robot is, and then tell the robot. Right? So this was really cool because we, you know, when, I remember when we flew up, we were like, we don't even know if this INS thing is going to work up here because the North Pole is back there. Right? So it was, it was really, really challenging to try and figure some of this stuff out. Another one was to recharge and pull the data off the vehicle. Right? We needed to be able to capture it while it was underwater because if you've got a little ice camp in the middle of nowhere, you can't haul this thing up. Right? I, I don't know if this appears big to you guys, but trust me, it's big. Right? So, so we needed to have that capability um, to capture it, to charge it without ever pulling it out of the water. Um, and, you know, so, which meant a few uh, interesting missions while we were up there. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was such a fun part. I never thought when I was like, studying computer science that I'd be like, literally up there with this monstrosity trying to drill holes in the ice right, um, to put modems down. But that's exactly what we had to do because we had no idea how to do it. Right? So sure enough, you know, we went up. We set up these little sort of ice camps um, and, and drilled holes. Right? So here's a good example of me wearing, looking like I'm about to rob the only Arctic liquor store. Um, <laughs> But uh, turns out there isn't one. So, uh, so those are long missions. But, um, and we would drill these holes, and we would put them in. And then they, they had a vehicle here where we were doing experiments with the vehicle. Um, and it was, it was a, a really neat set of missions, because we had to develop stuff that, that just didn't, we had no idea how to do it, right? So they did it. That was the cool thing. So right, like, the early science missions I was on, and then, then I went to Italy, and uh, I took one for the team. And the rest of them went up and, and did this. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but you can see, like, they broke the vehicle down into these pieces, right? Because you can't have big airplanes up there, right? Um, so they break it down in pieces. They would assemble it again, and they'd set up these camps. And then they would put the vehicle. You can see sort of the setup here. So there's a hole right there. Um, and there's the vehicle. And they would drop the vehicle in. The vehicle would go off and do these multi-day missions. And it was so complex what they were trying to do, right? Um, in the back here is... Uh, one of the gentlemen that was responsible for these missions, and, and I remember asking him after, I was like, you know, when, when you let that go, and it went for three days, or two days, did you ever sit there and wonder, like, what did I forget, right? <laughs> because the tricky bit was once the vehicle went to depth, you can't talk to it, right? So if it's gone, it's gone. The only way you're going to find out that you messed something up is when it doesn't come back a couple days later, right? So, so credit to you, Richard. That must have been some really, really long nights. But, you know, they did it. And you can see sort of uh, some bathy images here, uh, multi, you know, beyond 3,000 meters deep. And they ran these multi-day missions. And the vehicles came back. We still have these vehicles, right? Um, so, so to me, you know, that was, that was purely successful thanks to, to the hard work of a lot of really, really cool and innovative people. So you know, just wrapping it up, like, where are we going? Because um, we need that capability, right? Um, and you can sort of see another example of what I was talking about earlier. So this little guy was really bored, and it's in doing a lot of these missions. Because you can't communicate underwater, we, we end up starting to do things like getting the robots to have their own interest. Right? So the robots don't get told what to do. They select what they want to do. Right? So that's kind of the next step. It's called decentralized. It's really cool stuff. Teaming humans with robots. This is, this is a huge one. Right? Um, you know, expanding the robustness, right? So, so increasing the capabilities of these robots and, and, and allowing them to, to move into different kind of missions. Um, making them trustable is a big one because, you know, a lot of people don't really think about trust in robotics until you're actually working with robotics all the time, right? Because you can imagine, if you send a robot out in a, in a dangerous area, maybe it's a minefield on the ground or a minefield in the water, and the robot comes back and it's like, yep, you're good. Sorry, you going to charge in there, right? <laughs> this is a problem, right? And this is what we need to think about. How do we make those robots trustable? Um, you know, enhancing the role of robotic systems. Like I said, there's, there's so many applications, right? Um, and novel applications, right? Um, you know, we, we'll talk about, like, I, I mentioned surgical robot here because guess who the next speaker is? Um, but also because, you know, that's a good example of where autonomous technologies can start to augment the capabilities of things like surgical, right? So imagine if you had a surgical robot that was on a ship, and that ship was in a disaster area. And 12 surgeons across the country, all with different capabilities, could use that robot at different times, right? That's a cool novel application, right? And that's where I think you know, um, ro modern robotics is going to go. 
is, is augmenting those capabilities. Right? So that's it, folks. Uh, you know, thanks so much. And uh, you know, like I said, if you have any questions, pop them into Slido, and I'm looking forward to answering them after. So we'll just take about, uh, 10, 15 minutes, let Ricardo get set up and have his glass of wine, and then, uh, then we'll get into the second talk.
That's good. Hey, folks. Um, so this one, this one's kind of fun, and I've been I've been waiting for this um, to to be able to introduce Dr. Rendon. Um, so Dr. Ricardo Rendon did his his med school and residency in Bogota, Colombia. Um, he subsequently completed a clinical and research oral oncology fellowship at University of Toronto uh, and a master's in community health uh, clinical epidemiology. He joined Dal uh, in Halifax uh, in 2001, where he's a professor in the Department of Urology and Director of Research and Clinical Trials. Uh, he is the chair of the Genito-Urinary Cancer Site Team, uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority Cancer Program. Uh, Dr. Rendon is currently the Vice President of Education of the Canadian Urological Association and Secretary Treasurer of uh, the Canadian Urologic Oncology Group. Um, his, while his clinical practice focuses on all areas of uh, urologic oncology, uh, his research focuses on renal cell carcinoma, advanced prostate cancer, and urothelial cell carcinoma. And he's good at Scrabble. Um, <laughs> so this, this one's a bit personal for me. I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of introducing people all throughout this, this whole series, right? But Ricardo is the guy um, who, when I talked about, you know, I met this surgeon who kind of gave me that that lifeline to help me get out of the funk that I was in when I found out I was sick. He's the guy. And Agnes, is, it's the same. So, you know, I'm, it's, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Ricardo Randall. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, it's going to be a tough act to follow, uh, Warren. That was an outstanding talk. Uh, I've spent a a while talking to him in my office while other people are waiting in the waiting room. <laughs> so, uh, so if I'm running behind, which I usually am, that's probably because Warren is there. Um, and Agnes talking about her golf game. So, uh, it's, so that was outstanding. Uh, I'm not usually giving talks to uh, non-physicians. Uh, all the things he read is because I can't say no to anything, so that's what's got me in trouble. And uh, so this is very exciting. This is one of the things that I do. I do cancer uh, only, cancer neurology, and uh, I'm not here to tell you a sad story or a happy story because someone picked me because they. The foundation helped us. So all I got out of this was a phenomenal toy. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the way I see it. It's an off-the-shelf toy that is extremely expensive. 
And uh, it, the expense is not only the actual toy, but the disposable for every case. So when the actual foundation had to collect the money, the whole number wasn't just this part, it was the disposables per case. So every case about $2,700 worth of disposables. So the foundation is paying for five years worth of that for all the surgeries that are happening. So, so you've spent 5400 you spend 5400 <laughs> so uh, uh, so you're cut off so uh, so so as I was saying it's, it's very difficult to to get start to get excited about something that is just off the shelf because it's just off the shelf it's a plug and play it doesn't plug into anything fancy it's just a three prong uh, thing that goes and they just roll in and out of the in and out of the of, of the room uh, so, one of the things that, that I think it was very important, that, so the foundation, we've been talking about the robot for many, many, many years, but this is not a, a, a rich province where to get, the, the, the robot is cheaper now, but initially it was a lot more than that. So we've been working on this for more than 10 years, trying to get the robot here, and finally we managed to get uh, the robot, and it is, it is a pleasure to uh, working with this, and this has put us in a place that we can uh, uh, offer things that are offered elsewhere and it's very intuitive and it's very easy to reach the level that other people who have done many 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 cases have reached so it's uh, allowed us to do a lot of really cool stuff so uh, so let's start so what about the history of robotics so this is the 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 the, the da Vinci they started in uh, is this not working Okay, so this, oh, there it is. So they developed a prototype in the uh, 1980s. Uh, it was uh, with a U.S. Army uh, contract. And then you can see then they introduced the Da Vinci robot. This is when I started my fellowship. I was in Toronto. I had just arrived from, from Colombia. And they, uh, there was a company had developed an arm that, because doing surgery in the pelvis is very difficult because the camera has to go in this direction. So when you're standing, you're sort of standing like this, working like this for several hours. So it's really a very difficult surgery. So develop a, a, an arm that was just facing down into the, the it, it was called ESOP. So the cool thing is that you had a headset and then you tell it ESOP in, out, up, down, and that's all it did and we were so excited about that. And then they started to grow and little by little, they gobbled up every single company that was coming up with cool things, and they, they became the only uh, company in the market. So nice strategy, worked out really well for them. <laughs> so then, he, then uh, the first robotic uh, laparoscopic surgery was done in 2000, and then today it's, there are many thousands in, in, uh, in all over the world. This is for Canada. We didn't have the first robot. We didn't have the second robot. We had the 42nd robot in Canada. So many thousands of cases have been done uh, before we got to it. And uh, so we waited and waited, and uh, we were really excited about what was happening. So what are the advantages of having a robotic system? So one is shorter ho hospital stay. Agnes, the reason why you had the surgery is not because it was a robot. It was because I was able for that particular surgery to shorten the, the hospital stay from f an average of four and a half days to about one night for, uh, on average. So that was a dramatic savings. The, the institutions don't see that as a saving because, yes, we're, sh we're uh, shaving three days, but that bed is still going to be used by someone else. It's not like the hospital is saving. Uh, ours, as a society, we're, sa we're getting better, mm -hmm. but it's not a saving for the hospital. It's a faster recovery and return to normal activities. You heard Agnes say that how she quickly she returned to normal activities. Fewer complications, we have seen that in our practice. Increased safety, we'll talk about different reasons for that. Less pain and less risk for, risk for infection because the openings are smaller, uh, less scarring, uh, more precise uh, surgical outcomes and reduced bleeding. So that's what we've seen with all the surgeries that we're doing. So right now the program is being used by urology. So two surgeons, uh, my junior colleague Ross Mason and myself. So when he did his fellowship, uh, he trained with a robot. So being able to bring him back uh, was very important for us because he trained under us 
and then left for the Mayo Clinic. He trained really well, but everything that he did was in robotics. So had he not had a robot to come back here, he would have been doing whatever we taught him before he went to learn something else for two years. So it was very important to be able to bring people here and to retain them. And uh, so uh, then gynecology is also doing uh, surgeries. Uh, so those are the two programs that I started earlier. Um, and then um, uh, ENT is now doing some surgeries. So we uh, had a budget of, uh, I don't remember how many number of cases, for five years. And in urology, uh, in, at the end of year two, we had already gone to close to four years of what we had predicted because we had a great start. So, but again, uh, that means uh, more money. What about the surgeon? So we don't talk a lot of the surgeon. It's not very cheap to go and say, you know, it is good for me as well. So one is uh, ergonomics. The other one is uh, improved visualization, better, better surgical performance. The, the learning curve uh, is shortened dramatically, and I'm going to show you a little example later. And surgical training is easy to train uh, someone, uh, mentorship and collaboration. So uh, I can teach my residents because there is two consoles. So there's one here, one there, and then uh, the, and we can swap instruments between one. And we can swap one instrument, two instruments, or three instruments. So, so it is great. Also mentorship. So I have a junior colleague, uh, so I can come in sometimes and uh, help him, or sometimes I'll call him and, and he, he helps me. And collaboration with other specialties. Sometimes some of the other surgeons, so I have a problem that I cannot fix myself, uh, then some of the other surgeons uh, come in into... Uh, the robot and they, they can help me or can uh, guide them through helping me. Other benefits, so things that are, I think is very important is centralization of care. Uh, there is a lot of surgery that gets done often in smaller peripheral centers and there is a lot of data uh, saying that there are some surgeries that should really, really uh, be centralized. So that has allowed to bring in some of those uh, surgeries back in-house. and. Uh, further development of expertise. So I had done an, a good number of uh, surgeries before this. So I was 18, year, 18 years into my career uh, when I started to use the robot. And then uh, very quickly you can expand your expertise or having a new uh, a staff help them uh, develop uh, expertise. Obviously there are drawbacks, uh, cost, so 8.1 million for five years of operating, which we consume a lot of the disposable uh, in uh, two and a half years. There's no tactile feedback. So you end up having to change the way you operate and what you're seeing so it is not what you're feeling. is the way when you touch something with the robot, how it responds. When you are tying a knot, you have to see the threads in the knot, how they start to uh, get tight, and then you stop pulling, and at the beginning you break them, and eventually you stop breaking them. So it is amazing because with this thing you can pull until is there, there is no tomorrow. They're super strong, so we have to be really careful with that. And uh, it's also uh, decreased training in some more complex procedures because a lot of the places are not going to have robots. So when I am training residents, they're not going to have um, the ability, so if they learn with the robot, they're not going to be able to have the ability to go and work in Truro in a robot because they don't have a robot. Uh, and also some of the complex that are doing are quite comp uh, the procedures are doing right now are quite complex. So they're not going to be doing the trainees a lot of the surgeries. They may be doing some steps, but probably not the whole thing at the end. So it will have some, it's changing dramatically the way surgeons are being uh, trained. So what about uh, training? So uh, training is uh, very cool. So uh, you can have, um, so it, there is there's simulation. So you can have simulation. So we have uh, a tower behind one of the consoles. And you can use different uh, type of uh, uh, tests that you can do. And it gives you a score. And it tell, gives you, or you can do actually simulated surgery. So you can see you go and click there and you're changing your instruments. And uh, here I have scissors, I have another instrument, and uh, it's, it's, a quite, it's a great simulator. And then you can, this is the beauty of this, is that you can calculate uh, the statistics. And uh, once you see the statistics, then you can get better or 
or not, but because not, <laughs> because not everyone, uh, not everyone wants to see their numbers, and it is tough for some of us. Uh, or uh, you can do things like this. Um, so uh, this is the robot, and obviously that's a grape. So you can also do uh, cadaver labs, or you can do uh, the grape one is a, a very common lab that we do because it takes quite a bit of skills to peel the skin off of uh, of a grape. Uh, so, and there are a lot uh, going to meetings uh, where there are minimal invasive surgery meetings. A lot of people come up with these fantastic models. Uh, some of them are really, really cool uh, on how to do uh, different procedures. So clearly you can see that they're doing a great job. So just imagine the size of that instrument. And I'm going to show you some, uh, some other stuff later. Um, so that's pretty cool, right? So uh, it's a toy, as I, as I said. At the end of the day, <laughs> it is a toy. So. So as Warren was saying, it has advantages, makes me uh, better. Um, some of the nurses said, I didn't think you thought you could be better. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, one of them is probably watching. And, uh, so, uh, so what are the advantages? So one, it, it's precision. So it is really precise. The visualization uh, is, is amazing. So it allows me to see planes, things that I've never seen. Uh, before, uh, and it also makes me a better open surgery surgeon. And the reason why I went into cancer is because I wanted to do big surgery, and I still love big surgeries, but I love this part as well. Um, I like, eventually, I learned to uh, uh, like the clinic part of my practice, but surgery is, surgery is what I wanted to do. Uh, <laughs> So I have more control. I can control my camera. So when I'm doing laparoscopic surgery, and let's say a, a resident is assisting me or I'm assisting the resident, I tell the resident just pull back, move in, uh, go left, and then is it left of the, left of the, of the patient, my left, the left of the screen, <laughs> which left, and then you use some terms and they don't know the terms or I don't know the terms. There is a fourth arm. So the thing has four arms. I have one camera in the middle. And then you have two arms, and there is a fourth arm. So I'll show you a little bit about the fourth arm in the second. Um, it's less assistant dependent, except for some things still uh, need assisting. So I need to, any, every bit of blood that can be in, sometimes it can be a lot. So it has to be actively working. Uh, we have to switch instruments. And uh, we, uh, they still have to pass the sutures and uh, clips or different uh, things that I'm using. And the ergonomics, obviously, is a great thing for us. So in terms of precision, there is no tremor. Um, or you cannot crush something uh, too much. You, you can only close the robot as hard as it, it, if you close it. One is closed. You can't close it anymore. It doesn't get tired. Okay, So that's good. So yesterday I did an open surgery. It was very difficult. I went uh, home exhausted. When they do robotic surgery, it's not as tiring. It's still stressful and tiring. Um, the other thing is when you replace instruments, so for instance, if I'm working with someone, I have my, uh, doing something lap laparoscopic, I have my, I'm looking at the monitor, I have my hands here, I'm working like that, and someone is changing instruments, and they have to remember the trajectory from the skin all the way to the area where we're working. Otherwise, if they don't remember that, I, they have to pull the camera out, and then try to find that instrument and help it go in. But that can happen, so you sort of have to remember that. So some people are better at 3D uh, orientation, some people are not as good at 3D. So here is uh, just placing one instrument. Uh, so here you can see, this is the port, that's the tube that goes inside of the patient. And it just gets advanced. And one of the cool things, for instance, I, I, this is what I like of the robot, is when you pull the instrument out and you replace it, the next instrument goes exactly in the same trajectory and it's going to be a millimeter away from where it was the last time. So nothing has changed. It goes to whatever it was. So I, as a surgeon, I'm, I'm happy because no one could be going in a different trajectory, picking something else up that shouldn't uh, be picked up. The other thing is I have a camera control. So these are my, my, my pedals here. 
So I can control the camera with that. So I can, I can push the camera in, I can push the camera out, I can rotate like this to try to go into a corner, uh, or uh, so or many uh, different uh, directions. So I have full control over my camera. Uh, so this is me sitting there. Sometimes, because I'm moving the camera, I'm moving things, sometimes my arms, as you can see, one is down here, the other one is here. It has a clutch. So if you press the clutch, then you can bring them back to a neutral position like any car. Uh, so that's uh, phenomenal. So it brings my hands again so I don't uh, kill myself uh, trying to move things. So just someone sitting in a lab, let's just put a clutch on this thing. So I find that uh, exciting. Um, this doesn't uh, project as well because this, um, everyone had dinner. Um, I, <laughs> this one is not too bad. Actually, none of them are too bad. So just, re just remember, the tip of this is about, of my scissors, is about uh, five to eight millimeters, I'm going to say. So you can see that it's a little tiny area. So I'm trying to mobilize that, we call dissect. And, uh, um, so it, it is that you feel like you, when you're doing, seeing it in a 3D, because it's 3D, uh, then you're seeing it, uh, you're right there, like you were standing uh, working on that. The other thing is the degrees of freedom. So you can actually move this in many, many ways that there is no wrist or arm that could do all those movements. So it is amazing to get into corners or to do a really uh, fine dissection. So again, another capability. So you can see that it has joints here, joints here, joints here. Um, I brought um, one of the, the, the physicians who assists me brought one of the instruments here. And uh, I'm just going to pass it around if you guys can. I, uh, oh, that's the one I used on Warren. You're <laughs> here? It's, that's good now. Uh, no, it's clean. It's clean. It's good. So, um, so that's a training. That's a training one. So, uh, the fourth arm. So, um, a lot of the time when I'm doing surgery, I'm in a corner where I have some tissue that is falling over me. So, what I can do is with my pedal, I can swap and bring the forearm in there, position that arm, retract whatever I'm trying to retract, and then. Uh, just switch it back to my, my working arm. So these are my, this is my left hand, right hand, but see, I should be using this to work. So what I do is I bring the other arm, brought it here, now that is holding there, and now I keep working. So I can, I can move my arm uh, uh, and interchange it. That was a, a, a bit of a, so this, just so you guys know, this is the cava, that's the major vein in your body, it's about that big and uh, it bleeds quite a bit, so being able, is, so it's a robot, I'm not sitting there, but I'm very comfortable uh, dealing with, uh, with that. What, what part of the body is in the universe? Like right inside, right in the middle of your body. Uh, so there is also something really cool, uh, uh, what they call rotation, uh, remote center or rotation pivot. So these arms can pull really hard. So you can put a lot of strain on the, on the abdominal wall. So what they came up with is, uh, you see there is a little black line there, and that's what they call the remote center. So it doesn't matter how you move it, the, the, the arm is gonna be pivoting right here at the skin where the muscles are, so it decreases the strain in your abdominal wall. So again, another uh, really uh, cool, uh, cool uh, um, development that they, that they created. Some other things that there, we can have access to uh, firefly fluorescence imaging. So this is to see blood vessels. So you can see there is a blood vessel there, uh, but once you put the firefly, uh, you can see the blood vessels a lot better, and then you can change the image and the colors and use firefly uh, in, the, in the monitors. Ergonomics, so ergonomics, uh, you can see that I'm sitting uh, on a phenomenal chair that comes with uh, the Da Vinci. I was promised that um, if I did well tonight, I was going to get one of these for my house, but uh, <laughs> hopefully that will work. So that's uh, Ross Mason, my colleague. Uh, so this is uh, the way it looks. I'll come back to the... So, and you can see the movements. Uh, it doesn't, you no, no need to do like that, like that unless you're uh, 
moving the, the monitor. Uh, the other thing that was very important for us is to set up the, the starting a new program is the hospital was amazing at uh, choosing the, 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 the best nurses and uh, the best team and the best anesthetists to get this program off the, off the ground really well. And that's why I think we, we, we had a great team and we put it together. And with the support of, uh, of the, the Da Vinci uh, people, John is sitting uh, in the back, has been great. So, uh, so my transition, so before doing, this is the partial nephrectomy. We do mostly uh, kidney and prostate cancer surgery. We can do a lot of other surgeries. Um, uh, so I had done about 800 open or laparoscopic cases uh, before this. So I had uh, John Kawakami, a good friend of mine who worked in, in Calgary, come and proctor me. So they basically, so I do all my training, and then he comes and proctor. Unfortunately, uh, June passed, uh, passed away from uh, pancreatic cancer this, uh, this year at uh, 48. Um, so uh, then watch lots of videos. Every time I go to a meeting, I watch videos anyway. So this is another reason to watch more videos. And the transition uh, from uh, laparoscopic to robotics is very easy. So uh, it's very intuitive. So it's super, super easy uh, to do this. Uh, it's the same technique, just better instruments. So it's not like I was, I was, when I was telling my patients, like the first time I got a consent for my very first case. So, well, I had someone else working with me for every case that I, I did for a couple of days for different cases. But when I was on my own, they say, how many, so I, had, I say, you know, this is the first one I'm doing on my own, but this is just similar to what I've done before. It just is a better uh, toy and better instrument. So I felt comfortable uh, to tell that to my patients. Uh, but there are a bunch of things that you need to learn at the end of the day. So this is the surgery. So let's say kidney surgery is a bunch of little holes, anywhere from uh, six to seven of them. Uh, and this is what the ports look like. So cameras and instruments go through that. And um, everyone had dinner, I hope. <laughs> so once, once I do this, so I, uh, I connect the robot to the ends of this instrument. So the robot is connected to that. And then I'm done. I put the instruments in, and I move to the console. So this is what my console looks like. That's a 3D uh, vision. And these are my uh, controls and the pedals and more controls here and to the left. So this is what the pedals look like. This is for energy, different energy sources. This is for the camera. And this thing on the left that you click with the side of your foot is to switch that fourth arm and you can uh, swap arms. And as I said, from here, I can give one or two or three of my instruments to, to the person who's assisting me or who I'm working with. If I think I want a little tilt on the console, then I can tilt it, I can move it up, I can move it down, so it uh, it's, uh, has everything. So this is the way it looks uh, of the shell. So you have the two consoles, the robot with uh, the arms, and this is the, the brains of the operation. Uh, so it has a screen, all the energy sources, connection, and uh, everything else about the light. Uh, this is the way it looks when I, it doesn't look as, as uh, nice. So this is uh, Ross Mason again operating. There is somewhere back here at the other side of the room is the other console. This room is not particularly big. And this is our assistant, Sam Chan. Uh, so also, Sam has been amazing at helping us because um, we have often the same assistant, so over and over and over. So they end up knowing what your next move is. So it makes the surgery uh, uh, very efficient. Uh, so this is uh, Ross again uh, working. You can see his moves there. But when you see it uh, up and close, it's not a lot of work. Actually, I ended up developing a tendinitis because you end up doing uh, uh, hours and hours of that fine movement. And, uh, and there are things that you can learn, that you have to learn. So for instance, when you're uh, stressed, you try to grab it harder, and you hold harder. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Once you get close, it's just not going to close any harder. So you just have to learn to relax. So that's so I had to go for physio for that, and then I learned to relax a little bit. And this is Sam uh, helping us. So you can see the movements of the arms right there. Uh, you don't see there's like big uh, uh, white moves, although sometimes they are. And then he's assisting here from, from the side. Uh, so this is a, a, a nicer video. The other ones are all edited by me. A nicer video. So this is the robot being uh, docked. Uh, 
So those are the tubes, the ports, and they are connected to the robot. And then I pass the camera, the $47,000 e US each. And uh, so we have to be very careful not dropping those. Um, <laughs> and this is the way they are connected to the instrument that uh, is passing around. And then we advance the instruments. And we have a lot of different energy sor sources. We can cut it with different instruments. So it's not just a scissors and a grasper. It's a bunch of different things. Um, so uh, when I'm doing prostate surgery, the patient has to, oh, the patient has to have the, pa the, the head down, like a 30 degree uh, head down. So they're really standing. And then I move into the console. Uh, I take my, my uh, scrubs off. So uh, yeah, so we do touch the patient at the beginning. I go in and I put the tubes in. And then at the end, when I'm finished here, I go and take the whatever part, organ is. And then we, um, uh, so I scrub in again. So, um, so it's allowed us, so this is a CAT scan to do really cool cases. So I've never done a case as complex as this one before. Um, when I did open surgery, uh, I've done, as I said, about 800 of these surgeries before, but this allowed me to do, this poor woman showed up with two kidneys. So a kidney is about four to five inches, and this is replaced by that tumor in a really complex location, and on top of that, the other uh, tumors. So these are not little tumors, um, so they are uh, bigger, and uh, this patient did amazingly well and was playing golf shortly after. <laughs> So, uh, this got stuck. So, for me, so it was a, a challenge and it was a pleasure, but, uh, but it's a treat for me as a surgeon, as a nerd, to uh, be able to do these things. Uh, this is uh, a smaller tumor. Uh, in a really complex location right smack in the middle of the kidney. Most people would take the whole kidney out for that, but you only end up with one. Uh, so that is what the kidney looks like right there. Um, and this is what the surgery looks like. Unfortunately, there is a little bit of, a, of a dirt here on the, the lens. One of the cool things is because it's, it's uh, 3D, so you can switch that dirt to your dominant or non-dominant eye so you don't see it anymore uh, because you have it in the other. So I just want you to see the, so this is about a one and a half speed. Uh, this is the major artery of your, uh, uh, sorry, this is the kidney, the, uh, the main artery, one of the arteries going to the kidneys. One of the things about kidneys is they carry, these organs are about that big, they carry about 20% of the total blood volume every moment. So there's a lot of high pressure blood going through it. So we had to clamp it. You saw me put a clamp in there. Um, so now we are just uh, cutting that. So I could do this laparoscopically before, not in, in what Agnes have for sure, not even close. Uh, this one is very close to the major blood vessels. Um, so, um, and I never felt, as long as I have a good assistant, I never felt like I was relinquishing, relinquishing uh, control. I actually have more control than, uh, than what I do, what I did when I was doing open surgery. So once I started to do this, I stopped doing open surgery for this. And the cuts for this are extremely painful. There are big cuts that go from side to side, cut through three layers of muscles, and they're quite painful. So, um, once you dissected out the tumor, yeah. how do you remove it? We put it in a bag. Right. We put it in a bag, it's like uh, one of those butterfly nets, right. but plastic, and then that's what we put in the inside of a bag. Uh, so, as I was saying, so the, bleed, the, the kidneys can bleed a lot, uh, and uh, so that's why there is no blood going into this kidney. So, but the kidney, because I'm not cooling it down during the surgery, the kidney is still warm, so uh, we have to do this surgery quickly, so other that was the kidney is going to be having uh, damage from just being not perfused with blood with oxygen. So, uh, I'm almost finished with that. 
So, uh, so that's a surgery, so that's a complex tumor, and it just takes very quickly. So it, that whole thing would have taken me, setting it up and everything, about an hour, uh, and before it was a lot longer than that. So one of the cool things, again, data is very important, is the data driven, so we can do things where uh, you can see, for instance, the, the, the hospital stay has dropped down uh, significantly. This is uh, uh, data that we looked at a while ago. So you can have scorecards, you can have all the people in your province, in the country, if you want to manage this as, uh, uh, that way. We don't do that yet. Um, but ideally, we should all get a report card like everyone does, uh, but uh, we don't do that. Uh, so ideally, we should be able to uh, do better at that. And uh, just to finish, so one of the problems as well, uh, again, is cost. It's ex very expensive. Uh, it's not easy for every institution uh, to buy one. one uh, in the States, they have a lot of them. They're all purchased by the institutions, not here. They're all, except for Alberta, uh, they were all purchased through uh, uh, donations. Uh, so what's going to bring costs down? Competition. The company, Intuitive, is starting to bring costs down already. Uh, there is a new one coming in, Medtronic. Doesn't look as cool as the other one. Uh, the, look, the guy looks, uh, they could have put him in a more ergonomic position uh, to make it look cooler. So more, 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 uh, more things coming up. And as Warren was saying, is uh, remote surgery. So the only limitation we have at the end of the day for remote surgery is the bandwidth. So because there is a the lag between when I do something and it gets done uh, in Europe. So they did a uh, gallbladder surgery in, uh, in New York, and uh, the patient was in, uh, in Paris. Uh, but that's a simple surgery, and there was a bit of a lag. So once, once uh, uh, information can go faster, we're going to be able to do all those uh, cool things that Warren was saying. So off the shelf, but really cool. Uh, so thank you everyone who, everyone who co contributed and thank you for your attention tonight. Thanks Ricardo. Okay folks, we're gonna take a, just five minutes, um, set up a couple stools, there's a bunch of Slido questions, so we'll, uh, we'll rip through those. So about five minutes, grab yourself a drink and uh, we'll be back. That was a great talk. That was awesome. lectures about how to do
So I'm just waiting. I'm hooked up. I'm not sure if Ricardo is or not. Um, I can't see John back there, but uh, no. I'm guessing by the jazz. Cool. Um, so this is actually kind of my favorite part of the night um, because there's there's a lot of discussion about kind of some of the some of the cool questions that have popped up through the night. Um, so I'm going to just rip through this list. There's, there's a lot of questions tonight for on Slido. Um, so I'll just start at the top. And, and one, this is totally in, in your wheelhouse. Um, Agnes mentioned how quickly life resumed after surgery and that there was no need for chemo or radiation. Uh, is this due to the precision of the robotic surgery? So um, with... Uh so different cancers, you know, when, when, I, when I tell my patients, they always say, oh, particularly, we do a lot of prostate cancer surgery with this. Everyone talks to their neighbor, their, their cousins, their friends, and they, they equate their cancer to their friends. Or, but every cancer is different. We just happen to call it kidney cancer or prostate cancer. And uh, so in kidney cancer, if the tumor is successfully removed surgically, it doesn't matter how you take it out, then uh, hopefully the patient will not need additional uh, treatments. Uh, right now, the state of the art is basically you take it out, and then you don't give radiation or surgery after that, and then you hope for the best. Right now. Uh, we are doing studies given uh, treatments afterwards with uh, chemotherapy. Okay. Uh, but no, so the surgery just makes, the robot makes me the surgery make a better surgery and decreases the chance of having the tumor come back, uh, but not, doesn't really eliminate the need for radiation or chemotherapy. So is that end. kind of the, the robot is increasing the likelihood that you get all of it? Exactly, yeah. yeah. But that is the local component. The problem with cancer is also the cells that have learned to spread through the bloodstream that could have done that before I got to the mm -hmm. surgery. Let's go. Cool. Um, so the next one is, uh, is development in robotics mainly a software problem? Mm -hmm. Or is there a still chance for more hardware or mechanical development? Um, so I'll, I'll jump on this one. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, the mm -hmm. robotics, the, the progression of robotics is, is sort of, in, in my view, sort of three phases, right? It, it is software, it is hardware, and then there's the social aspect of trusting robotics and using robotics. So, um, you know, when, when we talk about autonomy and things like that, like I was talking about earlier, that is absolutely a software problem, right? Um, but, you know, how do you make the robot more robust in the environment? How do you make it more persistent so it can stay in the environment? How do you make it do better things? Surgical robotics is a, is a good example, right? Um, there's there's a lot of hardware development in, in in making the robot better at sensing or actuating. So so it, it is definitely still a lot more work in in hardware development for sure. Um, so for Ricardo, how does three D visualization work? Are there multiple cameras? Yeah, so uh, there are multiple cameras, and uh, is it how many cameras? Is it two cameras, yeah. right? Two cameras. Yeah. So so there are two cameras. And they are at different angles in the lens. And uh, so I get that in my visor as well. And that's why I was saying if I want, have one lens and I'm too lazy to, or I don't want to change the, the, pull the, the camera out to clean it, then uh, I just switch off that lens and I'm just going to do most of the viewing from the, from the other one. So it's just two cameras at the tip of the, of the lens. So I'm assuming they're on a fixed baseline, because the last yes. thing I want is a cross-eyed surgeon. Yeah. Right, they're, they're right. so yeah. Um, so how do you get depth perception from the camera console during surgery? I mean, I think you, know, you just oh, described it's, uh, that. It's just amazing. It's just 3D. And it, you feel like uh, what I was saying there in, in their website, they say immerse, immerse uh, view, and you feel like you're in there. It's just unbelievable. My assistant, who is working outside, don't, doesn't see that, just uh, sees a single screen. So sometimes you say, just do this there, and then he starts to move around because they don't see it the, the same way. Uh, but the person who's on the other console sees it exactly the same way. So why, why can't you cool down the kidney to increase your surgery time? Uh, because we don't need to cool it down because it's been shown that up to 30 minutes is good. Um, 
on average 30 minutes, it's a bit, a bit longer, and in 30 minutes you can do a lot of stuff. So uh, <laughs> when we did it open, we used to cool it. We did a trial, a research uh, trial nationally where we cooled down the kidney versus uh, keeping it warm the way it is. And as long as your times are decent, uh, it doesn't make a difference, and the cooling just prolongs it. And technically, it's actually very difficult to do it inside, getting all that ice inside and contain it in one area around the kidney. Uh, some people have tried to do it. It's very, uh, very difficult, and it doesn't add much, as long as the surgery gets done in a re reasonable amount of time. Hmm. So one question came up, which is probably more related to my talk, is how does tide or current affect dead reckoning? Um, it absolutely does. When you're trying to navigate, um, you know, tide and current uh, will move a robot in weird ways, right? So if it's flying along um, and you have a weird current, then, then it may cause something that's called crabbing, where, where the robot's trying to do this. Um, and, and what those accelerometers will do, remember I, I related it to the way a human does with, with the, the little, I can't remember the name of the things in your ears. Um, so, so we try and do the same thing with, with accelerometers. Right, and, and the idea is you're trying to detect every little movement at any given time and then add them all up and then that sort of gives you what your path was, right? And, and at the end of that path is where you are, right? So, so that's called a pose estimate that, that we do. Um, uh, so absolutely, tide and current will mess it up, right? Because just like humans, whenever you measure something, there's error when you measure it, right? So if you start summing things up, then you're summing up the, the measurement you want, but you're also summing up errors with that measurement, right? So, so that's what we call drift, right? And it's, it's a real problem. Um, so are there other robots in other departments at QE2 or anywhere else in uh, NSHA? So right now we're working on uh, acquiring some for, so different specialties use different robots. This one can be used for different specialties as well. So this was the first purchase of uh, our robotics program but this is just the first one of uh, many to come. So that's why we're not just finished now. This is one of many, so we actually need more of this kind and different kinds. It can be used for cardiovascular surgery, orthopedics, as you saw uh, recently. There are robots that are a bit simpler for simpler tasks that are quite repetitive as well. So we're working on it. Uh, so it's one of many to come. So, they, so uh, Johnny, who works uh, with Intuitive, was saying, I got to teach you something about cost. Because there are different models that have shown that this is uh, cost uh, beneficial. Uh, one of the problems is with uh, the, the way uh, our system works in Canada is every part of the process comes out of different silos. So when you guys are recovering, those six weeks, eight weeks come from a di different pocket. Uh, the, the time that your spouse had to take yeah. off to look after you and after the kids, but then the parts of the, that we're using come of a different silo. My, my payment and the payment of the anesthetist come from a different one. So uh, once they start to talk together, the, the, the saving is going to be dramatic. Right now, the savings are good because we're uh, ble uh, a lot less blood loss. I haven't transfused anyone in the 300 surgeries that we've done in this uh, uh, two years. Uh, not a single person. Transfusions are extremely expensive. A day in bed. My dad was here. Uh, he lives in Colombia. He was paying as a non-Canadian. So he had to pay 4200 bucks a night uh, just for the, for the hotel component of a hospital. For a Canadian, I think it's like uh, $2,400. So just, and that's before tests and anything like that. So uh, all those costs, if you put them together, is a dramatic improvement in, in terms of cost expenses. Hmm. So uh, can robotic surgery, okay, so we, we sort of hit this earlier, but um, one of the questions is, can robotic surgery be done remotely? Um, that is a surgeon in one location, say Halifax, and the patient in another using it like a mobile robotic unit, containerized. Um, and I think you kind of hit on this. Um, yeah. And I, I think um, as, as sort of a, an autonomous robotics nerd, um, I, I, I find this really interesting because you can see this capability um, in so many places where if you could connect surgeons like you and maybe a, another type of surgeon in Toronto and another type of surgeon in Vancouver, um, if you can get the lag down, if, if you can augment with 
things like error correction or or autonomy to do some of the basic things when yeah, communications yeah. become difficult. You know, I mean, I, I really see this as kind of a, I hate to use the term because it sounds bad in this context, but a killer application yeah. of, <laughs> you know, of, of, of robotics, right? Um, you know, there's, there's so many cases where we have had disasters in the world where, you know, you've got maybe a couple of warships from a certain country sitting offshore. Yeah. Um, if one of those ships had a robot and then all of a sudden a network of surgeons and doctors and, and professionals somewhere else in, in another country, exactly. right? There's, there's such a huge capability there. And, and then you have tele-mentoring and, and uh, so many opportunities to do so many things, yeah. Um, so, question, do you find that development in the robotic industry is slowing down compared to when I started? Um, you know, not at all. Uh, mainly in government, they're saying here, but, but not at all. I mean, the application of robotics, you know, I mean, I showed the example of Theseus in, in the 80s. Um, what made Theseus so notable was that, you know, nobody had really done it before, right? Um, you know, when you looked at Cornerstone, what made Cornerstone so notable is that nobody had really done it before. But now it's been done, right? And you're starting to see more and more applications of under-ice robotics, of deep-sea robotics. Um, and that, that's just in the maritime domain, right? Space robotics, aerial robotics. Um, what, what I think a lot of people don't think about is that robotics are changing our lives every single day. It's just you don't necessarily see the thing that's changing your life as a robot, right? Um, whether it's something in the water, whether it's something in, in my kidneys, whether it's, it's something in space, right? Um, so, so I actually see the pace as accelerating because with the new generation of people, there's a new, uh, how do I say this, new, new perception or new, new, new set of trust um, that comes with using robotics, right? Um, you know, so, so I, I think that we are, we are in a really, really cool spot right now because we're seeing kind of the genesis of what's going to be um, the integration of day-to-day -day robotics in our everyday lives, right? So, and I mean, I think you're seeing it yeah. too in the hospitals, right? Um, <laughs> how many AAVs have you lost underwater? Um, you do realize my boss is in this room, right? Like, <laughs> uh, no, you know what? Um, Whenever you put something in the water, you're always running the risk that it's not going to come back. Um, how many AVs that we've lost that we haven't been able to recover? Uh, one. Um, one off Belgium about, I don't know, six years ago. Uh, it went away and it, it, it just didn't come back. Um, <laughs> don't know where it went. Uh, it's probably on a fit, like, honestly, like in Ostend, Belgium, there's probably a fisherman who has this thing on his front lawn <laughs> and he doesn't know what it is, but he found it. Right. Um, but other than that, you know, most of the time we, we work with the systems in very controlled environments, right? Because we're experimenting with them. Um, so the basin's a good example. So, you know, uh, when you drive by the basin sometime, if, if you look and you see like a bunch of little gray boats and, and a big yellow thing, that's probably because we're doing experimentation with it. And it's not just us, it could be BIO, it could be, there's a bunch of organizations that are doing this kind of stuff. Um, you know, so when we, when we lose one, hopefully, as you think about the basin, it's kind of shaped like this, right? You have a pretty bad luck if it goes that way and goes out of the basin, right? So most of the time we can pick it up on a beach or, or get some divers to pick it up, right? But, but frankly, I mean, part of doing research is losing and breaking stuff, right? Um, so, so, but only one. Only one that I can remember and, uh, and only one I will actually admit to. Um, <laughs> So um, this is for either presenter. Um, as a recent engineering graduate with an interest in robotics, what skills do you suggest that I develop to get my foot through the door? Um, well, I mean, medicine's a good example. Um, you know, it, it really depends on what you want to do, right? Autonomous robotics, it depends what you're doing in engineering. Um, but you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it's, if you're really interested in it, you know, seek out the opportunities, right? Whether it's working with government, whether it's working in biomedical engineering, um, whether it's working for a hospital, right? There's, you know, you follow those opportunities and uh, you just, I hate to say it because it sounds so lame, but you just work at it, right? Um, I started in computer science and my interest was, was initially was data mining and then I ended up with machine learning and uh, worked at MDA with, with some great folks and, and then also I ended up in robotics for the government. Um, you know, so you never really know how it's going to go, right? Um, Dr. Randon, were you good at video games <laughs> to acquire the capabilities to perform these robotic surgeries? This is actually a, a, a pretty interesting question when you think about it. Yeah, so uh, 
So I was good at video games. I, I didn't play PS anything. <laughs> um, so I was uh, from the Atari and uh, era. So when you said, you were, you're talking about old people and you said your age and everything, I was one of the ones who was wearing the crop tops and <laughs> using those things while you were probably being fed at home baby bottles. So, um, so just, just have to watch your use of language. So um, I, uh, I was good at it. Um, I was actually, uh, I had to, when I got a, a new computer, a phone, I have to delete all the games that it comes with it because I, it just gets addicted. So I don't have any in my, in my phone or my computer. But yeah, I was good. I, I'm good at, at, at 3D special things. I'm good at reading maps. Um, that's costed us, uh, my wife and I, a lot of fights. <laughs> and because uh, she says she's good too. So, uh, and, uh, so uh, I'm good at maps. I, yeah, so I'm good at 3D orientating myself. I think that's, uh, that comes in very handy in surgery, particularly when you don't have your hands in there. This one, you don't need to be as good with 3D orientation because you have the 3D view. But when you're doing a lot of 2D, so you have to convert uh, his CAT scan that you just saw in an image here, which is 2D, put it in your head, and then you have to create a round thing out of that and put it in the 2D screen that you're seeing there in front of you and then start to work around it. So I think some people are better at that than, than, mm -hmm. than others. And you can see with the trainers, so uh, when you're training people, so uh, some of them are natural, but most people will eventually get it anyway. Um, I but find it's yeah. really interesting though how some people, <clears throat> I can't do it, um, I can barely use chopsticks, um, how some people can sort of transfer their perspective, mm -hmm. right? So, so in that case, um, driving a submarine is another good example, right? Where you're not actively sensing with your own senses, right? You're just taking in information that's artificial, mm -hmm. right? And, and you can do that. You can, you can build an image of what's going on around you, right? Um, uh, and I think that's, you know, you say, well, you can just pick it up, right? Um, I think you can, but like a, a good ROV driver in the, in, the, in the ocean, right? They have an intuition for where the manipulators are on the ROV and what's going on mm -hmm. around it that, that their sensors may not even be telling them. Right, so they have a good way of integrating information that um, that I don't think everybody necessarily has. Right, I think some of the things are are built in. So today, just that one example. So uh, before we put the, the 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 camera, the robotic camera in, we have to go in with a regular camera. So it's a 2D, and so we go in from the front. But the patient had several surgeries before, so I had to go in from the back to try to mobilize some of the stuff that were in the way. So the camera was facing this way, and I was working from the back looking at the camera. So if I went up, my scissors moved down. If I move left, then my scissors go right. And then you start trying to adjust your visual cues, and then you start to get a little better. But eventually, you stop using your visual cues, and you're using different uh, references. Uh, and then your, your brain adjusts. So I think a brain is plastic enough that most people will be good at it. There are some people, like in anything they do, sports or anything, that are better. Some mm -hmm. people are naturally gifted. Sure. It, right? so. so you're saying you're naturally gifted. <laughs> That's where you're going. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, during, the sur during the surgery, if a tumor is bigger size than the hole it's inserted through, I've actually wondered this, right? Because yeah. for everybody who saw the picture where he's got all the tubes in people, right? Um, so you end up waking up, and it looks like somebody attacked you with a fork, <laughs> right? Because you have all these little spots, right? And then if you have both sides, you end up like, I mean, it's, it's, you can draw constellations on my abdomen, right? Um, so, so how do you actually deal with that? If, you know, because I remember my biggest scar was about this big, yeah. right? So if the tumor's bigger than that, do you, do you slice and dice the tumor? No, do so all the holes, so, so the biggest hole is, uh, uh, there is one instrument that is not robotic, it's for the assistant, that it goes through a 12 millimeter channel, so that's the biggest hole. But uh, we have to make, eventually, extend one of the, the holes to the size of the tumor, uh, to be able to come uh, take it out. So if the tumor is that big, then the hole is gonna be that big. If the tumor is that big, then some people come and say, how come you say you did the surgery robotically, but I have a big cut? Uh, so no, so we did it 
uh, robotically, but cuts up here hurt a lot. Mm. Uh, so we make cuts down here to remove the tumors that we're doing with kidney tumor. Um, yeah, so as, uh, this cut is as big as the tumor is because we can't sure. chop it up and take it out because we miss some information that we really need. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So you mentioned about um, not being able to do surgeries laparoscopically. Um, why is that? Like, why? What? What about the robot would allow you to then do that surgery correctly? So the so <coughs> one the, the main one is the prostate cancer surgery is uh, called a prostatectomy. So uh, the pelvis is like a funnel, and the prostate sits sits right at the bottom, and uh, so it is a very tight space. So is the pelvis is right here, and you're working from up here but you're standing here when the patient is facing that way. So you have to work, as I said, that way. And uh, it's a very intricate job. So the first video that I show you that was just in a little concentrated area, so that's part of that surgery. So um, ergonomically it makes it a lot better. And the stitching, because you're stitching really far from you in a really awkward area, so the stitching requires a lot of training and so the results weren't very good. It wasn't a good surgery. So as soon as uh, the ro robots came out, the states completely switched from laparoscopic to robotics. Here, uh, we took us a while, obviously, to get there, but, uh, but no one really is doing that laparoscopic. It's an incredibly difficult surgery. It's actually not a very good surgery uh, because it's technically very challenging. So, um well, there was a question, why is this robot only funded by donors in Canada? Um, how can we get it provincially or federally funded? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think that's probably a broader question than what you or I could answer. Um, I certainly have thought about that personally um, as we were putting this together. And, and, you know, like when I look at, as, as you mentioned, the, the total cost of the surgery, right? Like, you know, um, I think Agnes is on the same boat as me. Like... You know, from from when I found out I was I was genuinely sick, until when I was back to work it was less than ten weeks, right? Um, so the cost to, in this case, the government, in other words, the cost to all of you guys, <laughs> of me being off sick was was a fair bit lower than if you had had mm -hmm. to, you know, like put mm -hmm. these massive cuts in me and, and I'd be home and I'd be bitching and complaining. Um, so, so you know, there, there's there's I think I think we have to look at it as a total cost, right? Yeah. And and I think there was a. a when I was reading about Da Vinci and reading about the fact that, that things are being funded here uh, through donations, that was one of the things I looked at. And there's a study in Ontario that started to look this way. Yeah. Like, you know, what is the total cost of these things? And, and I think it's something that, you know, that, that's, I don't know. I don't know how you'd answer that other than, you know, you, you got to answer by talking to your government in that case, right? Um, but the government, the hospital is also trying to pay for a leaky roof and to, you know, it's, yep. it's just that they, the, it's such an expensive system, so not having, I work in the States, I work in Colombia, I work here. Uh, so I know it is not a perfect model. I know for simple things, it's probably not super reactive, our system. But for big things, uh, I think this is the best place uh, we can be. Uh, but it's extremely expensive and everything is becoming more and more expensive now. And there's no more money, uh, so I, it's a long conversation. So if you could change something about Da Vinci though, what would you do? other than cost? Um, so Da Vinci is still not great. So personally, uh, I think it, it could do, I'm going to rephrase that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I need the, I need the robot to be a, a couple, a two or three inches higher. <laughs> so uh, I was going to frame it differently. So. Uh, um, so there are still there are still a few things. So I don't know if you saw all the plastic that, that you saw in there. Uh, so all that is a lot of plastic going out. Uh, the instruments have to be replaced a bit more often, although the company is starting to change. Uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, the actual practicality of things, switching instruments sometimes takes a while and the angles are different as you probably saw. The patient is down here, but the machine of the anesthetist is here, so there's no lot of room. So there's still some things that are more difficult. They have different robots now that are uh, less clunky, although this is a fantastic robot, um, and, and they continue to work on that. I, I, I don't have one particular thing that I would change, like that I'm missing right now. 
So one question popped up here. Um, do I think that Halifax, or Canada in general, is late or up to date with the developments in the robotics industry? Um, I would argue we're up to date. Um, when you look at some of the innovative work that's going on, um, believe it or not, we have this ocean supercluster just across the harbor. Um, and they're doing all kinds of cool stuff there. Right? Um, Ontario, um, you know, with the universities that are there, so U of T, McGill, McGill's doing neat stuff. Um, so come back in that case. But, um, you know, Waterloo is doing interesting stuff. There's, you know, there's a ton of really cool innovation that goes on in Canada. And I just think sometimes as Canadians, we're not good enough at blowing our own horns in that sense, right? We have a couple of companies that get huge, and I don't know why, but then they just explode. Right, um, but but there's a ton of really really neat innovation and on the West Coast. You can you can keep going with that as well, right? So so I would say we are absolutely up to date. Um, you know, just here there's there's a, a company that does really really advanced robotic sensing uh, for deep sea research. Um, you know, you you saw Dave give a talk a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, that's that's really cool work, right? There's companies on the West Coast that are doing the exact same thing. So so I absolutely think that. That Canada is a very innovative country. It's just that our personalities are the type that we won't blow our own horns um, to, to some of the capabilities here. So, so anyways, folks, I'm going to go through maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll uh, we'll kick off here. So, um, so is 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 a robotic surgery better than an open surgery, and why is that? So for some things, so as I said, I, I don't do robotic surg uh, open surgery for kidney tumors, for instance. It's a lot better uh, because it lets me get into corners, it's more precise, I can see the little arteries better, so I can do things that I couldn't do before with open surgery, so that way is a lot better. There are still a bunch of things, and, and, and that's funny enough, and, and, and Johnny will remember this, so I definitely wanted to do prostate surgery, but I was pretty good at doing this kidney surgery laparoscopically, so I sort of had to uh, achieve a reputation for that particular surgery, um, and uh, so I said I can do anything. But then I started to use this, and yeah, the prostate surgery is fine. It, it, you know, it's a nice improvement, but with this robot and, and in the kidney, it's just um, unbelievable. So it is a lot better for some things. Uh, there's still some other uh, surgeries that, um, that are complex that is not ready for it. Uh, so some surgeries have to still be done open. But um, I'm sure we're just transitioning. Probably a lot of things are going to transition to robotics. Well, and I guess that, that leads into the, the sort of last question that it sort of stood out is, is you know, why is there only urology, gynecology, um, and ENT using the robot? Um, you know, there are all kinds of, I mean, yeah. I've seen this on the internet, right? Every time I even have a hangnail, I've got cancer. So, you know, there's a yeah. whole bunch of different forms of cancer. You know, are we going to see mm -hmm. a bit of a, mm -hmm. you know, a revolution in, in robotic surgery? So, for, for again, it comes down to, to availability, right? So. The robot has to be used by, and it has to be shared. So you can only share uh, between so many groups uh, because then it, then it just becomes a problem. So that's when we start to need more robots uh, because one robot doesn't do it. So as I said, our program in two years, uh, we've done uh, what we're expecting to do in four, four and a half years. <coughs> so so uh, it's, um, it's a model of availability. So I use it two days a week, so that leaves uh, three days of the robot uh, left, and uh, Ross uh, uses it one to two days a week, and Ecology uses it one and a half days a week. So that's like five and a half days of a week of five days. So it just becomes a problem of uh, who can use mm -hmm. it. Yeah. In Halifax, do patients have the option to choose robotic surgery, or is it the luck of the So it depends on the surgeon you go to. So if you come to me, I won't do an open... Uh, Prostate, prostate surgery anymore uh, because robotically I think it's better, at least better in my hands. I've done like 1,200 of them open before and I think it's better now. Uh, for partial nephrectomy in my hands, you won't, I won't do it open unless you've had multiple, multiple surgeries, like five, six surgeries um, in that same kidney. Uh, there are other ro surgeons who don't do robotics. Um, and then you may not get the robotic option. So you have to ask. 
You have to ask. You have to ask. Like, like, like anything. And, and that's one of the things that is difficult as a, as a doctor, as a cancer doctor, is a lot of people, particularly guys who are not married, uh, they don't advocate for themselves. You know, there is a lot of cracks in the system. Some patients get lost to follow up. And they said, oh, they would never called me. I thought everything was fine. That's what they never called me. So you have to advocate for yourself, right? Whether it's something as simple as this or, or something at uh, being on top of, uh, of your case. So it's a treat. I don't mind people who ask a lot of questions because then you realize that, uh, that uh, they're on top of their, their situation. So I think it's, and, and, and medicine has changed. Fortunately, a lot of the cancers in urology and, and, and older populations, so they don't want to piss off their doctor. They don't want to say anything. I think times are changing, and uh, um, you know, it's just the service, uh, like any other service. Yeah. So advocate for yourselves. Yeah. So, folks, um, I so this is the last night of the Final Robotics series, and uh, for folks that have come out and joined us each night or just tonight, you know, um, I want to thank you all for for coming out. This has been. A pretty incredible experience, actually, to, to sit here and, and be able to host some of the some of the amazing speakers that have that have come out. Um, but if you'll indulge me for a second, because it is last night, I do want to thank a few people. Um, obviously, you know the speakers. So, Dr. Michael Dunbar, um, Dave Shea, uh, Dr. May Cito, um, Ed Gregson, Dr. Vince Myers, um, Dr. Ricardo Randa, because um, these folks took the time to come out. Also, definitely, uh, I want to say a massive thanks to the Carlton staff and, um, you know, Karen and John and everybody else, because if I had done this on my own, we would be in a warehouse somewhere <laughs> and the sound would have been terrible. So, you know, these guys know how to put on an incredible show and incredible food, and, and I cannot say thank you enough to these folks, so please, you know. <laughs> And then finally, I'm going to rip through the, the last two big things I think that were important. Um, QE2 Foundation, because they, they change lives. And I hope you guys have seen that. And certainly I can say that. And, and you know, so Amanda Hatt, who helped put this together. Um, Stacey Squires, who you all emailed. Um, and Jess Campbell, who you never met. And I hope she's watching, actually. <laughs> Jess, Jess has been involved since the beginning of this. Um, people who don't know, we tried to do this three times. <laughs> But COVID kept happening. Every time we got close, COVID would happen. And it's like, ah, uh, we've got to cancel it. Um, so in the meantime, Jess managed to, to have a baby. So she's been kind of busy. Um, but Jess was incredible with sitting down and hashing out the ideas. And, and she really brought the professionalism to this. Because I just, I literally showed up with a list of friends and a notebook that's like, do talks. Um, and she turned it into this. So, so that was amazing. And then, you know, from a personal perspective, um, you know, uh, my wife Amy and, of course, uh, Michelle Crane, who they were kind of the creative team. We spent a lot of bottles of wine um, <laughs> talking about this. And, you know, and then, of course, to, to everybody who spent their time to come out and to contribute to the, QE found, the QE2 Foundation and, and to just coming up with the great questions and, and having a great night for the last three nights. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I hope you have a great night. I hope you drive home safe. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Thank you. A year and a half to, to get it right. <laughs> I know. And uh, Warren had to put up with me not responding emails because my email <laughs> is a uh, disaster. Um, uh, one of the things I want to say, we don't just sit down and beg for something to show up and it doesn't show up. So, so we actually talk to a lot of people. We, we wanted this to happen. Uh, then uh, the foundation helped us. And uh, we, as a department, we put some money uh, as well as a group, as a department, departmental money. And individually, we also donated uh, all the surgeons that are, who are involved uh, significantly. So because we are... Uh, we benefit as much as, as you guys do being able to provide a good service. So, yeah, the foundation has been amazing uh, working with this. So thanks, everyone, and have a good night. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother.